So you're starting the process of trying to get data from point A to point B, and you know you're gonna have to build dozens of different pipelines. So you go out there and you start trying to look at different solutions. You look at Airflow, you look at Prefect, you look at Mage, you look at Dagster, and you know, for one reason or another, they're just not right, or you just keep running into issues. Maybe you're just trying to avoid paying for a solution. And you're wondering, should you just build your own data pipeline system? I've seen a few of these posts on Reddit where people are asking, should we just build you know, our own version of Airflow? And I often see this happen, especially since I'm a consultant that comes in and gets to see a lot of different data infrastructure. I see varying approaches to how people get data from point A to point B using some level of custom code. So in this video, what I want to discuss is some of the examples, some, some of what I've seen people do. So if you are trying to approach this problem, you can at least see what other people are thinking and how they approach it. And also talk about if you are going to do it, what, what you really do need to consider. Because I think it's one of those things like many other systems or ideas that on one side seem simple, right? How hard could it be to build a generic system that manages all of our data connectors? But it seems like a simple problem, right? Like why not build your own EL solution? your own five train, your own estuary, your own portable. But when you dig down into it, there are varying components in the process. Like let's say there's someone who commented about capturing schema changes uh, in the video where I wrote about API connectors. And then I actually went to um, estuary and talked to them about it. And again, they have a system that they've built that isn't just as simple as again, looking at table A, looking at table B and looking at the changes. There are different things to consider when you capture schema changes. And so there's all these little decisions going from there to orchestrators that you have to make along the way that are what make building your own orchestrator hard. So we'll talk about those as well. But for now, let's dive into a few examples of what I've seen and what I've worked on and built myself in terms of a data workflow system. And I'm kind of being generic here because look, there's orchestrators that really are meant to manage the flows of processes. And then there are systems that are a little more rigid. And so I kind of look at this as like a spectrum, right? On one side, you have these very rigid solutions. Generally, they aren't built as orchestrators, they are built more as procedural code and they don't allow for much in terms of like adding new functionality yet, right? Like when you have to add in more uh, data connectors or something like that, you have to write a new data connector from scratch. And then that code just gets added into the process, added into the list of what you're running. Versus with an orchestrator, you're generally just adding in those data pipelines, those DAGs into a system that's already running again, versus kind of like chunking it at the end of your prior system. So let's talk about some examples of systems that I've seen uh, that run people's more rigid systems. And I say rigid because this is generally how they look. I, I've seen two different approaches really here. Um, well, one, in all cases, you have some sort of scheduler, a little scheduler here, you know, usually cron or Microsoft task scheduler. That will then call just a script and this script will be like main.py or something, you know, it's, it's the main run. And this is what I mean when I say it's very rigid. From here, if you're to open it up, what you will see is that main.py really just calls a bunch of scripts in order. So you're gonna have these scripts and right, like one of these is gonna be like extract HubSpot, extract just so it doesn't go out, uh, API2. These are all, right, are gonna look like this inside that main.py. And it has to run in this order, right? Like you're just gonna transform uh, one and it's gonna be these different methods. And then in between this, in between all of those, you're gonna have like some logging, right? You're gonna have that like classic print extract HubSpot ran successfully in there. That's what it's going to look like. Like I've seen this a thousand times, maybe not a thousand, but I've seen this a few different times, right? Like in here, in between each of these snippets of code, that's what's going to be in there, right? But again, in order to add more to this, you have to go to the main file. And in order to do this, in order for any edits in this process, edits have to be made uh, in the main.py file. So you have to go back to main.py and always edit it and then create these scripts. And again, every time you have a new API, you have to write a new non-generic script. The other approach that I've seen that again, is a little more rigid, but getting there, right? Like as you start trying to build a generic system, you'll still have this part, but instead of going and running all of these methods, you know, one by one, you'll end up saying, hey, instead of doing that, I have folders. So instead of doing, right? And actually let's, let's, let's kind of separate this out. So this will be scripts calling scripts. Kind of approach and in this one it's more it's a little bit better you're, you've got a script reading folders with scripts inside so you're still doing a script and script but uh generally inside of these you might either have things like this extract hub spot so let's let's just do that so maybe you have your uh extract folder so these are all your extracts maybe you have it broken up by transforms likely instead of doing this approach you, you probably have broken it out more likely like this is hubspot 
and then this is Salesforce. And then maybe you have like a transform for later transform. So you might have some transforms in HubSpot. You might have some transforms in Salesforce. But if, if you ever have to combine them, you put them like in a transformer in some sort of analytics folder. And instead of having to go back to main.py to make any edits, to add new, let's say new pipelines, you just add them to the folders. Now in main.py, what it might look like. So actually let's do that. In it, what it, It's going to look one of two ways. Either you're going to point at it and say just run the folders as is but maybe you have a specific order so in there you're going to have you know run hubspot which then points at uh this folder here and actually it probably is just like more generic it's probably like probably something like run module and then in here you have hubspot and you should give it the folder name and then after that same same as before right you've got this print extract hey look that 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 did well and then you run module and then in here you've got salesforce and so that will be what the main.py looks like. And so, yeah, then you'll have this thing happen again where it calls, it calls. And then inside of each of these, again, these are folders now, and these are scripts. So inside of these folders, you have scripts. You do have scripts here. And so now you got, kind of got this thing going on where it's going to call a bunch of scripts. And in here, you're going to have like extract hub spot again. Um, but you might also have, right, your transforms in here. And this is often SQL. So this will just be your transform hub.sql. Uh, and on top of that, in order to make sure that you have the right order, you generally add a number that's usually pretty common too you might you might either do a dot or something but you add something to the script name so that it has an order and then it calls it and runs it in that order and so this is a little right like this is still not generic enough right like i'm having to name things specifically right like this is all those little things that you have to think about when you don't have something like let's say dbt or some of the similar solutions you have to like literally go through these little things like oh i have to name my folders with the order or some files with the order that they're going to run in I mean, really, this can take a whole bunch of different forms. Like this could be a store procedure calling a bunch of store procedures. This could be a Python script, right? Like there's a ton of different approaches here, right? Like maybe instead of this main, this main might just be kicking off a bunch of store procedures that then call all the store procedures inside it, inside the store procedure. There's tons of executions. So this is just one. These are like some approaches that I've seen people build more generic and rigid systems. You can see that they're rigid because you have to follow this flow. And every time you have to write your own API extract, every time you have to go through this stuff, you have to put these print extract in here. So it's, it's a little more rigid. And again, there are different variations of this that I've seen. Instead of the scheduler, I've seen Jenkins use instead of Cron or something like that. So there's tons of different combinations of this exact thing that I've seen built over and over and over and over again. Obviously you can see this is not necessarily an orchestration system. This is more of, again, like a rigid data pipeline system. And I just want to kind of cover that so you kind of understand. This is what a lot of them tend to look like. Again, there, there are some different approaches. Again, instead of main.py, main might instead call a stored procedure that has tons of stored procedures. I, I've seen that a lot. And inside of that stored procedure, you have a bunch of print statements that then get logged into the main.py, et cetera. But it all kind of kind of ends up being the same. It goes through that process, right? And it's a little more generic. And that's kind of what happens is you're going more and more generic. You're building a system that allows you to add in new code more and more easily, right? Like as you need to do new things, it starts to take that into consideration and makes it easier. And the reason you might be on this spectrum somewhere, especially early on, is maybe you don't have a ton of need for abstraction and building things generically. Maybe you just need to build a few scripts and that's it. And they can run procedurally and it doesn't matter. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with using scripts as an approach, especially when you don't have complex dependency management where one script needs to run before the other. But you slowly start to realize, right? Like, and this is what most teams realize is like, well, we need script A to run before script B. And also it's really hard because every time I have a new data connector, I have to write it custom. Obviously now there's a uh, different open source connectors even there, but maybe you're writing it custom because these open source connectors don't have all the API connectors. There's 1500 alone uh, that Portable has, and even they don't have everything. And so then you start looking towards what orchestrators exist or what data pipeline tools exist. And for now, we're going to stick out of the UI-based solutions. We're going to be talking about more open source and uh, custom-built operators. On another plane, what I've seen, besides Airflow, is I've seen DataSwarm, which is Facebook's version of Airflow. It was kind of the granddaddy uh, before Airflow existed. And its code looks like this, as you can imagine. Very similar to Airflow. Very generic. Lets you do your transforms uh, pretty easily. Lets you have some level of data connectors, right? It doesn't have necessarily API connectors everywhere. Although there are things like the HTTP operator that exists and you can use. But eventually you might look at these different solutions. Again, I talked about some of them or I referenced them earlier, right? You've got Airflow, you've got Mage, you've got Prefect, you've got Daxter. There's honestly even more than just that. And you might be like, well, I don't like any of them for one reason or another. Or maybe we don't want to pay for a managed version of one of these solutions. And we think we can build it better. So if you're going down that route, here's the few things I want to have you consider. First, in terms of like the philosophical side and then we'll talk about the technical side of what you should include if you are going to go down that route one if you are going to go down the route of building your own orchestrator 
specifically an orchestrator, not this rigid system. Because if you're building a rigid system that, again, is kind of this more script that calls a bunch of scripts, that can make sense. And in that there's, there's reasons to do that. If you go down the route of building an orchestrator that is generic, it is a task. And so when I say that, you need to have the vision and the, the idea and the scope of what you actually want to cover. Because it is a massive task, right? Like you're trying to build something that is pretty massive. And that means you're going to need a lot of overhead, regardless of how smart you are. You can only build it so well if you're one employee. So you need to have the vision and the overhead in terms of like employees that can work on this project uh, for it to make sense. You also need to have a very clear design choice of like why you're doing this. Like what is the main reason? Like it can't be some small thing, you know, like, oh, Airflow doesn't let me track data or something or whatever it might be. And you can find different orchestrators that let you do it. It can't be some small thing right? It needs to be a big enough reason that your company has, at least, in, again, this is my opinion, for you to need to build a new orchestrator. There needs to be some design choice, some design decision that completely negates the other options that exist, right? If, if there isn't something clear, something so large that you obviously have to switch, um, I, I just feel like it's not a good use of your time. And then on the cost front, like if cost is the reason you're deciding to do that, I would have a really hard look at costs. Don't get me wrong, some of these managed services might feel like they can get expensive, but what's more expensive is needing a whole team because I think Facebook had, I don't even know how many software engineers working on Data Swarm and managing it. And then the platform engineers managing, you know, the actual management of Data Swarm. And obviously they're on a much bigger scale, but you know, you have to imagine you have one or two FTEs having to manage the system, add new functionality to it. It becomes something that needs to be maintained. And so if you're going to spend, let's let's even just put a small smaller number on it, not two employees. Let's say it's a hundred thousand dollars a year, essentially maintaining this code. It has to be worth it. There has to be some good trade-off. So cost is another thing that you need to consider as you're building this. So now we've gone over the considerations of like, okay, is it right, right? Like, do, should I build this orchestrator? Should I make this data orchestrator? Now that we've gone over those considerations, let's talk about some key points and functionality that orchestrators need to have, like modules and, and functionality. I'm going to start with one of my least favorite words, which is backfilling. And backfilling can feel easy in some cases if you have very simple pipelines. And I say that, but I do recall that every time I've ever had to backfill, even when it's only been a very like simple pipeline, if it's been business critical, it's always a little stressful because you're trying to rerun data and make sure you obviously get accurate data on the other side that people are expecting, um, especially if it's going into something that people will see immediately. So backfilling just means that you're having to rerun jobs in the past, often because either you're adding a new column, maybe you changed how a, a model or an algorithm is processed. And so you need to rerun different things. At Facebook, it was always a pain because I'd have to sometimes occasionally run like two years of backfill for something. And if there was like 50 tasks on one uh, pipeline, you can do the math, 365 days, 50 tasks, etc., or times two, because it's two years. There's a lot of tasks and, you know, that gets spread out and you hope everything runs, but every once in a while, there'd be something that would be ethereal and make something fail somewhere. Or maybe some data is no longer in a table because of a retention policy and now you have to figure out how to deal with, you know, either finding that data or replacing it. So backfilling can get hard, so make sure backfilling is easy with whatever system you have or you put in place. You have to make it so it's very easy for people to build idipotent pipelines, you know, whether that's through variables like making sure that when a pipeline is run for one specific date, that date that it represents has some uh, easy macro so that, you know, if you run it in the past for 1225, it runs for 1225 uh, and not the current date, right? So there's all these little things. Two, you need to have some method of dependency management, right? These systems need to be able to track, hey, task A needs to run before task B, before task C. And it can't be just, again, a procedural approach where, hey, if it fails before task B runs, it just won't keep going, right? Because you have more pipelines that need to run. You have many more pipelines uh, than your current very rigid system that you might have built. You now have hundreds of pipelines and you can't fail all the pipelines because one, you know, one of your DAGs failed and, and now everything's failing. You need to have something that clearly manages dependency management. Nor do you want on the flip side just for people to have hundreds of pipelines with no dependency management and everyone's just kind of guessing when times run. Next, you need to have a scheduler. Something needs to actually run these various tasks. And the fun thing there is that even at Facebook, we had issues on daylight savings. You know, if, when you had to either put the clock back or forward, you essentially had something funky happening where you either, you know, went back an hour and now you ran the job twice and that might have caused issues um, or various other problems that kind of occur as those things are happening. So your scheduler, whatever you're doing to actually track things needs to be easy. Um, to work with. You need to have some level of alerting and logging. And this is always hard because uh, I saw this tweet that was really funny that said like, alerting is always both too much and too little. 
uh, or whatever alerting you have is always too much and too little because that's what ends up happening. You have data quality alerts that eventually you end up ignoring because no matter how much you try to fix them, people don't do anything about them. But then you have actual data quality problems that get through because you didn't realize there was data quality problems there. I think Joe Reese once said that uh, data quality is a silent killer, right? You, you don't know it until sometimes years later uh, that you had a data quality issue and someone happened to check something somewhere. It's one of those things that a column could be wrong for years and no one notices because all the other data is right. Um, or maybe it's just off because you're rounding somewhere and no one notices because the numbers are kind of right. And there's so many ways that, you know, alerting is both a lot and a little. And obviously with logging, you just need to be able to go into your system. And I want to be able to write to the log, both custom, and then you have to have logs that also track various levels, right? You need to track logging at the system level. So, hey, how is Airflow doing as, as a system? Because if Airflow, the whole system goes down, I want to be able to figure out why did it go down? What do I need to fix? If Airflow, my pipeline goes down, I want to figure out what happened there. If Airflow, you know, a task went down, I need to figure out there. So there's different levels of logging that you need to capture. And I want to be able to edit and add my own logs too. If not like custom logs, at least custom messaging in said logs. And on top of that, you also need some level of metadata management. One that covers kind of data lineage, but it also covers times, like how long does different jobs run? Where is that getting captured? How many times do these jobs fail? Like all of these things need to be put somewhere. You have some database somewhere that's tracking all this information, which is why when you spin up Airflow on any of these managed services, there's some database that gets spun up at the same time because it needs to get managed somewhere. And honestly, there's probably more. Uh, you know, I haven't had to build a completely custom orchestrator myself. If, and if anyone has, feel free to add comments below. And if anyone has decided that all of these different tools like Mage, Prefect, Airflow, etc., are it good fits, please comment them below as well. I'd love to hear that. Always curious like what people think about the current solutions. But overall, I do think that most people are likely not in a good position to build their own orchestrator, either because they don't have enough time, resources. Um, there's just too small of a vision or a scope. Like you're, you're, you're envisioning it just for your company, which to me, if you're gonna build an orchestrator, <laughs> You might as well build it for, for the world because it's going to be so generic. Also because as you're building it, your company's going to grow and expand and maybe merge with 10 other companies. And so your orchestrator will have to be generic for 10 other companies anyways. So I think it's very important to think on that scale if you're going to actually go down the route um, of building something more on that orchestrator side of things. But with that, guys, I hope this was a helpful video. If you're thinking about building your own version of Airflow or something similar, I'd love to hear why. Uh, please put that in the comments below. But other than that, guys, thanks so much for watching and I'll see y'all in the next one. Thanks all. Goodbye.